Hey, Kersey, thanks for joining me. Uh, joining me again on the podcast, a, a sort of weird order that we had a recorded conversation. Now we're doing the more formal thing one on one, but it's good to have you here. What? Oh, what? Oh, last time. I, oh, you're talking about the the, the lovey dovey douchebags yeah, yeah, yeah. one. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is cool. I like I haven't done a thing like this in a minute and it's and they're, they're fun and I like chatting with you. So yeah, happy to be here. Glad you're here, friend. So um, yeah, maybe just as a sort of simple thing to start with, I, you just dropped another vibe reel and I'm very curious to hear more about the vibe reels, but uh, this one was yeah. so, so beautiful courtesy, definitely one of the best ones so far. And uh, would love to just hear you talk about that vibe reel and kind of what the impetus yeah. for it was. Oh, sweet. Um, yeah, let me think about it for a second. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's called Courtesy. It's the, you know, uh, quotes Kenneth Clark, who I try to, I've got like my sort of like roster of underappreciated writers, intellectuals, etc. cetera. Um, one of them I talk about, I try to reference whenever I can is Arnold Toynbee. Um, just like, I think there are people who will never have heard of Arnold Toynbee and but then I just try to talk about him all the time and another one of these yeah is Kenneth Clark so then Kenneth Clark is this art historian who made this incredible uh series in the 60s called Civilization with an S he's British and uh uh it's like 12 14 episodes or something it's almost I think all of it is on YouTube and um he goes through human history uh starting with like I think the first episode is called the skin of our teeth and he's talking about like the dark ages and the sort of idea that like you know the the light of civilization almost went out perhaps um and then he goes through um at least like the american revolution era and like i think later even like 1800s and he no way he actually goes all the way to the 20th century what am i talking about um and i love him and uh i love this this thing i have to have to Samo Buria every time I bring it up because he, you know, got a bunch of, of us to fucking watch it. And I've now seen it three or four times, but about the vibe reel, I mean, I, um, I wanted to use vibe reels to talk about, to, to, to summon spirits. Um, the, the vibe reel is a, a material artifact uh, meant to carry some sort of spiritual power. Now we have to be wary of idolatry um, and there's a, a broader topic of what idolatry is and whether it means whether objects can have spiritual power. I think that objects can have spiritual power, including, for example, people. Um, but uh, idolatry, I believe, is a, is a hyperfixation and sort of a taking a, a part to be the whole. And so the the part and the whole relationship with the vibrios is I'm trying to summon spirits and, and sort of put them into material artifacts. I don't know if there's probably some kind of like D and D archetype, some type of like shaman or some type of like conjuring wizard or something that, that does this and in, in the that I would might compare myself to but I'm trying to put the things in these objects but I also want them to have, have some kind of relationship to each other and that's something I haven't quite done yet um but uh but if someone I don't know if anybody out there is like studying me and my stuff but I have the idea you know you never know um for better or worse and but I have the idea that like sort of by the time my work is done a great coherence will will be made manifest and it may be more or less clear like uh, i guess i'm rambling already but that's why you have me sorry i'm gonna keep yeah the, the facial expression there is uh i realized when you say that like you could describe me as studying your stuff I, I really like the things you do and i've told you that before but yeah i watch closely what you do and i i'm that's right. why we're talking i'm curious to learn more about everything that you do so um, am I understanding correctly that you're sort of saying like the vibrials are, are uh, you could see them as parts of an emerging larger whole that you're sort of like putting in pieces to a bigger puzzle sort of thing? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's all one thing. I, I don't like, um, I don't want to do anything halfway. And then mm -hmm. when it comes to like making, making art, like a blog post is an artifact, right? Mm -hmm. Like a tweet mm -hmm. is like an artifact of this type. Um, I, I maybe focus on spiritual power, but there's also like intellectual content, you know, sort of like a, this idea of like an architectonic whole. Um, I'm in this situation that I find troublesome, uh, which is that the whole is not clear yet. I'm just, I'm building, like I'm, I'm trying, I'm laying down stones. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, 
I'm playing this video game Valheim where you mm. where you it's like you're like a Viking in like purgatory and you like build these like big towers, kind of like Minecraft style. And I, I get hyper fixed on these uh fixated on these on these towers. I spend like a long time like building it up and, and whatever. But um but yeah, so consuming my content is it is is one level of like getting the stuff that I'm trying to put out there. Um studying is like i guess i have my idea like like really the idea like I, I study i study kanye west right um and when i say study i mean like i listen i consume the stuff and i also think about it and try to figure out like what is everything that's going on so like i at this point like it's like i guess i am a fan i definitely am a fan but um and i guess i'm doing the thing that fans do which is learn everything they can about a subject but there's parts of it that i don't know that much about so like in terms of like um history of music i don't really know where kanye falls in because i'm not like a scholar of the history of music there's people out there who will know everything about that they'll be tracing all the samples he uses and the different like you know 1970s like r b people and like all the different you know um whenever rap music comes up people talk about slave spirituals and you know all this different sort of like there's a lineage and blah blah blah, blah. um i don't know anything about that um but uh I, I I'm focused on the parts I'm I'm interested in. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is I'm in the long game. Um, I want everything I put out to make sense and to be understandable in context. Part of the context of that is that the things you make early are worse than the things you make later. If you're dedicated, you are going to improve. Um, and so I just try to make stuff that I will approve of looking back when I'm wiser and better at everything I do. And so to wrap up the sort of the Kenneth Clark, you know, the courtesy, the vibe real sort of thing is um, uh, I care about civilization. Um, I want to, I'm like, if there's a single thing I think is worth supporting, it's like the collective uh, effort of humanity to do humanity's thing. And that's maybe a, another way that I, I refer to that as civilization. So I'm, I'm sort of um, putting a coin in the piggy bank on that one by, by making courtesy. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's interesting to hear you describe it as a whole and like how courtesy fits into that because we've talked about this before but that like the first one I think was was mammon and uh, it's just like a totally different vibe and yet I'm kind of um, exhilarated by thinking of like oh what's the whole picture where there's you know acknowledgement of mammon and like evil forces in the world and we talked about that and and also courtesy and caring for civilization and like you know I've, i of course being a lovey dovey uh love the line about like all, all all people are our brothers and sisters and um i forget exactly how you put it but something to that effect and and we channeled uh, that in your in your in your dance video <laughs> yes yes so um yeah so that we've already touched on so much that i want to dive deeper into but maybe we could just zoom back for a second and and yeah. Um, sort of introduce you and I would just love to hear from you who you are and what your life story has been like I, I know you personally as a friend but would love to hear more and I, I suspect that will also give some context for anyone that's watching like who you are and how you got to be here where you are now wherever this weird place is that you are now yeah um yeah, you you told me before we started that you were gonna ask me this question. I was just like, oh shit, he's actually asking this question. So <laughs> that's how everybody um, feels, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, who is Michael Kersey? Um, you know, I, I feel like we're in the process of finding out. Um, as far as life story, there's always I, I do have one frame that I can lean on. Um, which I've leaned on in the past, which is um, thinking about a succession of ideologies that I've been into. Um, in the meta of that, I'm a little suspicious of it because I used to get so much out of like ideologies and like being a believer in a thing. And, um, uh, you know, the truth is always weirder than that. Um, one thing I could say, I, I think I have a spin I can give on it though. Um, I'll, I'll tell the succession of ideologies and I'll sort of like give the spin. So um, when I was a kid, I was like 10 years old and I have this memory. And um, I remember thinking to myself, uh, life is awesome. Doing stuff is awesome. Um, I wish we could just do that forever. Right? And then I thought, okay, well, what are the ways that that could happen? And I thought like religion, and I was like, no, I don't really think that works. 
was my thought at the time. You know, um, I, yeah, like I haven't seen God do anything. It was my ten year old thought, right? Like I've asked for things, but just you know, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't. See, it hasn't. I've got a lot of things I'm trying, and that one hasn't like panned out. Okay. Um, two was I was like magic. Could magic do this? And I thought about this, and I thought like I've only really seen magic in books. I don't think that that's gonna work. And then I was like, can science do it? I thought about it for a second, and I was like, no, that's impossible. <laughs> that was my 10 year old. So then my conclusion was, I guess it's impossible. So what you need to do is like live life as, as well as you can, you know? Um, and uh, as an adolescent, I ended up getting really into this samurai philosophy, which we, I think we've talked about before. Um, we, well, we've definitely talked about it. I forget in which context we've talked about it, but privately. Um, so maybe privately. Say some more. Yeah, so I have a video on this. It's called like Samurai Parables or something like that. Um, I read this book called The Hagakure. It's a 1700s manual by this samurai like revivalist guy. 1700s is a weird time for, for the samurai because the this long period of peace, 268 year period of peace begins in 1600. That's the Tokugawa era. This thing is happening like 150 years in. The samurai are weird because they're like a military class right and then it's sort of like these people who were warlords in the preceding era become the aristocrats and then they spend hundreds of years trying to figure out like what does that even mean how do you be a warrior in a time of peace um and this guy who's writing like i thought like oh i don't know he's a samurai guy he's sort of like the just the, i'm getting the samurai perspective when i look back i actually skipped the preface of that book i read it like 18 20 times as a as like a 13 year old I skipped the preface of the book um apparently this guy was a total weirdo so it's kind of like if you were going to read about the 20th century and it was like the 22nd or 23rd century and you're like well let's find like a representative example of a person you know who lived in America um oh this guy Eliezer Yudkowsky he seems like pretty good and so like I was sort of like reading like samurai Eliezer Yudkowsky like a guy with very intense views very boldly argued um that like you could confuse it for like the this is the samurai perspective but it's like really is like a peculiar intellectual this guy Yamamoto Tsunetama so anyway that book is all about like meditating on death and martial virtue there's a lot of weird social advice in it um and a lot this social advice is like way more intense than anything you've ever thought of in your life where it's like you know talking about how um some uh some samurai's lord lost face and then the this guy the his the his samurai his retainer um found a way to take the fall and then committed seppuku and that was good you know it's like this is like this sort of ethos is loyalty it's sort of like take the fall for the guy and die and that's awesome like, we want things like that right there samurai are kind of these like um deeply the tokugawa era samurai are like in my understanding are like these like deeply socially sophisticated um like super soldiers you know who just like manifest the, the this like loyalty virtues anyway um i i i got really deep in the samurai point here um skipping forward i did that for a while super duper into martial arts um then later on i later on i kind of became sort of depressed i think like early in college um and then ended up finding transhumanism as another ideology that i got into um i went to this conference run by Humanity Plus at Caltech and met like all these people, started learning about the rationality community adjacent to that. Um, this first thing was like transhumanism, transhumanism though, like the extropians, you know, um, it's immortality is good, AI is awesome, we're gonna change our bodies, like cybernetic hyper brain stuff. Um, and I got really into Ayn Rand. I synthesized these into some kind of, you know, anarcho-transhumanist, you know, like, glorious great people egoism thing um i sharpened my dedication to the sort of uh libertarianism by becoming an, an anarcho-capitalist so it's sort of like the ones who think that the libertarians don't go far enough so i was just like ancap transhumanist blah 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 blah, blah. <clears throat> then um ran into the rationality memes and then it was like oh shit ai could destroy the world oh shit i actually there's lots i don't know about like sociology like i because i was like a an objectivist they thought i had like solved philosophy so i was like yeah hell yeah and i was like oh god what if i had and then so i started you know did my crisis there then i was a rationalist um time moved on i got into the ea stuff right and sort of whatever that sort of the expanded like rationality but like we were gonna 
broaden the scope of what it means to improve the world. Um, subsequently, you know, um, I, I joined this this place, Leverage Research, and I, um, you know, won't be too, go too far into that, but like spent like about seven years studying psychology, studying history, studying the mind, um, and ended up dropping a lot of my like strong associations with rationality and EA, coming up with my own kind of odd uh, perspective on the world that um, I guess is too close to me in time for me to call it stupid. Like the other ones I can be tongue in cheek about, but I'm like, no, nah, I like still believe a lot of stuff that I believed then. Um, left there, March, 2020, what month is it? Is it September? It's October, 2021. Um, and basically in the, in the last period of time, I've just continued like studying history and, um, you know, let me just comment on threads. So that's a succession of ideologies, it's like one fine way to tell the story. As far as threads as I see them, these days I'm trying to do this manifest spiritual truths in artifacts or in art, like art is just the, the high throughput way that I know of, but it would be in any way to do that, right? And um, one thread is actually spirituality. Um, so in reaching for all these ideologies, I think I was looking for like coherence, just like some kind of story that like made fucking sense of like everything I was seeing that also made victory of some type possible. Um, and victory is might feel like an overly like kind of trumped up term, but like, um, I hate feeling bad. Like, it seems like an obvious thing to say, but like, I hate feeling like some type of winning isn't possible. Some type of awesomeness isn't possible. Right. There's sort of this. Maybe this is my way of like maintaining the, the vibrant, joyous spirit of childhood where you're just like, we're gonna just do stuff and it's gonna be awesome. Um, I, I think where I've gone in and out of these troughs of these certain types of like depression and then back to the like ecstatic heights of vision or whatever, um, ideology definitely helped me through that. But the thing with ideology is like, you just gotta keep going, right? It's like you start, you sort of come up with your frame and, um, uh, but it's a draft, you know, and then the, the, the cracks start appearing and reality starts speaking through. Um, one of the things you find out if you really want to have a coherent worldview is that the truth matters because the truth keeps keeps coming in and kicking your ass and showing you that you're wrong. And you're like, wait a second, what if I could, you know, what if I could like, you know, go to where the puck is going, right? What if I just knew what was true? And then nothing could fuck with me anymore. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like a control, a sort of like control scheme. You're just like, if I've processed all the stuff that could come in and fuck with me, then I will remain whole, you know what I mean? Through the through the successive realizations of what is really going on, because I, I will be increasingly knowing what is going on. I will be, um, I will want to know what's going on. And so the truth stuff, I mean, definitely the, the rationality memes like affected me in a big way. Um, but yeah, there's the sort of spiritual coherence, there's the rationality stuff. Um, one more bit, because you asked me my life story, is uh, I used to like want to be a filmmaker as a kid. And then I decided not to, because I believe that making film would just be creating something like a shallow distraction from life. And um, I wanted to, instead of making a beautiful story of what life could be, I wanted life to be good. Um, it's possible that, I think that was probably the right move at the time. I was like, probably 16 or something when I was thinking about this. Um, but it's funny that I've come back to it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, sixth grade or seventh grade, I made this video about physics um, and the whole grade loved it. Like I just, it was like me riding a skateboard talking about like gravity and like, you know, like I was, you know, a kid or whatever. And just like, everyone loved it. I put in um, the offspring as the soundtrack and just like, I was kind of like a punk in you know, junior high and like everyone loved it. Third grade, I had this video, this movie idea that just is still stuck in development hell. Um, there was this video called, uh, this movie was gonna be called Sea Slugs. Um, the name was my, my friend's idea, but it was about these like like alien slugs that landed on earth and were like actually superheroes and gonna like save everything. Again, the entire grade was just like hyped about this. They're like, come to me with ideas. I'm like, no, yeah, we should do this. I had this whole vision, all these different villains and it's like, you know, fucking Terminator with a tiger arm and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I, it's possible that like, the, you know, I, 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 psychology, I suppose you could say is like a very extremely intense hobby of mine. And um, it, maybe it's the things that you get, like, if you get bombed with social approval at a young enough age, maybe that just like shapes the, the organism, you know, it shapes the talos or whatever. But in any case, like, I am back on this kind of like art and creation stuff, like for now, I, I, I do expect it to continue, but, you know, you expect things, and then they don't 
go that way and that's fine. Um, so, uh, but yes, yeah, storytelling. So the, the through lines there, you know, spirituality, some kind of truth seeking storytelling, um, extroversion, sort of pretty much always been extroverted. Uh, and, um, you know, social media is part of that. And so sort of a lot of people, I mean, anyone listening to this will be probably encountering it through social media in some way. Unless everyone who watches this goes out and tells their closest friends and family, you have to watch this interview between Tatashin and Michael Jersey. It's the best fucking thing you, I've ever seen in my life. Um, it changed me and it will change you too. If that happens, <laughs> then then people will be find it being it through normal, normal social interaction. Um, just as a, opposed just to abnormal thought. social interaction, which is social. Yeah, through technology. Through yeah. technology. Yeah. 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 Uh, can you can you say more about uh, I think I missed, or maybe you just sort of alighted, but sort of, you, you said that when you're creating, you're trying to like manifest spiritual truths. And, and what is, what does that mean for you? What, what, where does that come from? And uh, yeah. what, what is spirituality for you as you see it these days? Yeah. Um, I've received a, a bunch of memes about like art and what it is um, actually through my sister um, and who studied theater and does a bunch of stuff in that area. And, and one of these memes is, it's sort of uh, like, I, what does it say? Which is to say, I haven't drunk from the, the fountain directly. Like there are these, like there's a good history of like, what is art and how do you do it well? And there's a lineages and, um, but one of these ideas is you need to tell the truth. You know what I mean? Like if your shit's not good, you, you there's, it feels like truth. Um, it feels like speaking truth to when you're getting back on track. Um, and they mean that in a different way than like the rationalists mean truth. Sort of like a speaking your truth is a different thing than um, describing reality at the joints. But I think there are different, different ideas of truth. I think the, the sort of broad thing can be um, put together in a good way. Um, philosophy is some kind of through line. I guess that's related to the truth thing. Um, and uh, when you talk about spiritual truth, um, and you put it, something in front of somebody, when it resonates, uh, the, the experience of consuming like good art or good media is, is uh, it's all these things. I mean, it can be entrancing, et cetera, but it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like a fetish, right? It's like people in the, have fetishes, right? And if you don't do the fetish quite right, it's like, no, 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 no. Like <laughs> power dynamics, sure, but not a doctor. I don't like doctors. Someone could say that. You know, okay. I'm, I'm, fuck, not doctors. Some people have like Nazi fetishes. So, you know, it, it is spoken of that these things exist. Um, and uh, I, I would know nothing of anything. <laughs> else, um, and, uh, and I don't, I don't, I don't have a Nazi fetish. All right. Um, so, We're on record, so, everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, going back. Uh, so it's, it's like when you're watching media and something doesn't hit the spot, um, it's like a, it's like a fuck, it's like a, you know, it's like a, it's friction. It's just like, no, 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 not that. Right. And you'll find this where people will watch media and they get different things out of it. They'll be like, oh yeah, it was incredible. But I don't like that actor. Or they'll say, um, you know, they'll be like, people don't always know how to, how to describe what they did and didn't like. And people who are incredibly good at that are like, you know, the best film critics, a lot of shitty film critics, but a lot of, you know, there's some good ones. And um, Kenneth Clark, you know, is a great art historian and also art critic. And he's sort of, um, he performs a cool role where he's looking at these like really old and obscure art forms where you're like, I don't even know what it means. Like I'm looking at this medieval thing and all the guys are 2D and their hands are weird. And like, what is this? And he finds a way to convey to you like what is going on there. And you're like, oh, you know, he sort of translates language. Um, Anyway, but but going back, um, when something lands, you've done the you've done your job, um, and I think I, I opine here um, as as an artist or as a creator, when something and that that landing, it's it's a feeling, right? I mean, you create an experience in people where it's not they're not no longer focused on the the friction, um, they're just in it, and um, even possibly being changed by it in a way that they holistically are like feel good about or don't i mean uh another one of these one of these memes i've consumed secondhand um is uh what's the quote the quote says um art is for um comfort uh disturb comforting the disturbed and disturbing the comfortable 
Um, this is one of these. That's a sort of way of thinking about it. I don't necessarily agree or not. I, I just it's just an interesting idea. Um, I think I sort of disagree in some important ways, um, but nevertheless, it's resonant. Like I, I saw Medea in in um, actually at a high school play as a kid, and it was crazy. It's like I don't know if you know the story of Medea. Um, Medea vengeance against her husband kills her own children and the screen the the, the not the screen <clears throat> the play the platform the play whatever the lights go red and she's covered in blood and she screams and you're like ah <laughs> like you're just like oh my god but that's resonance too right it's not always a, a good experience in a normal way but it's like it's resonant so um basically what i'm saying is um like, I, I want to give people chills. That's one thing I've been thinking about lately. It's like, you know, I want to be a, be a chills manufacturer. Because mm. um, when someone gets chills, and they say like chills, like on social media or whatever, um, that's like an experience. It's a sp specific thing. Anyway, I, I'm, I, I've i sort of gone on about this. But um, does that make any sense? Is that sort of, it's like, a, I'm, I'm trying that... to give like a practical answer to what I'm trying to do with conveying mm. spiritual truths, you know? Yeah, I'm hearing that. Um... Well, for one thing, just reading between the lines here, it's not like you're um, attached to a particular religious faith or tradition at this point, but instead you're trying to like convey the truth in a way that is uh, impactful for people. Maybe it's inspiring or horrifying or edifying in some way, but it like has a felt resonant impact in some way. Yeah, there are ways that I could comment on like religion and spiritual belief because I have mm -hmm. gotten into that um in my life in the last couple of years mm -hmm. would that be yeah I said? Um, um i believe in god um i didn't used to and i in order to get to a point where i do i had to do a lot of personal philosophy i need to, to think a lot about what i meant by that and i still don't know if I'm sure, you know, like I, um, but there's something I, I was thinking about this the other day where I, okay, I'll, I'll just say it boldly. I think I more than perhaps anyone on earth um, am equipped to convey a certain concept. It's a broad claim, but it's about a narrow thing. A certain concept of naturalistic spiritual, spirituality that is deeply compatible with what people usually want to get out of theism and what people usually want to get out of atheism. Hmm. Um, now that I've said it boldly, I know that I've overstated it. And the way that I've overstated it is uh, I have failed a million times to explain to people um, what I mean by that. But for example, um, when people talk about religion, they're often very focused on, on belief um, like do doxa, I think would, is probably the philosophy term, and it's sort of like correct correct belief. And so, ideology, as you'd normally think of it, is like we've got these beliefs. Um, this is what God is. This is what Christ is. This is what uh, you should do. And we have the beliefs and whatever. Um, my own approach, it's it's like if I were if I were actually the Pope, <laughs> right? if I were actually in charge of people's spiritual whatever um, development, um, I'm like almost completely unconcerned with belief in that sense. I'm so much more concerned with process. And so um, I've been told that there's this concept process theology that I would vibe with totally. I haven't read anything about it, but this term has come up whenever I talk about this with some people. And um, like, is Michael Kersey an atheist or a theist? It like doesn't matter. What matters to me is that I keep returning to the question of, um, the big picture and what's going on and what significance that has for my fate. And if I go into and out of theism and atheism, that is only to be expected because who am I to know what my spirit must do in the face of the fucking universe? I don't know. Uh, to me though, I am confident that like good practices um, are good, right? And so it, I think I could, um, I've definitely overstated the, the thing I said before, um, but I but there's but there's a type of I'll at least say um, there's a type of prototypical um, theist or atheist who I can sit with as like 
essentially my students in this particular method, you know, the, the Kersey method of figuring out what the hell's going on. Um, and uh, I could, in the language of theism, talk to this theist and explain how everything we're doing is about God and we're going to figure out, you know, what God wants from us and how we're to reach him, et cetera. And I could equally sit with the atheist and talk about um, the, proto the mental protocol that we're going to run in order to reconcile with the big picture and how we're relating to our own concepts in a way that relates us to the true reality that sits outside of our concepts and intending to be changed by that in order to act more excellently and agentically in the world. And so the, the, there are two languages, but it's, it's one, um, I mean, they're different activities. They just would be customized to the people and they get the same benefits. So that, that's sort of a, a ramble about religion. And um, that's part of why, like, I don't know, is, is like my art religious art. Um, I hope it's so good that no one cares. <laughs> hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah, right, right. Um, there, there's so much here that I want to dive into deeper. And I'm, I imagine whoever's listening is like, has a similar feeling of wanting to ask like hundreds of questions at this point. Um, but it, just given the sort of circumstance of this conversation that we find ourselves yeah. in, it seems like uh, I would be uh, remiss if I did not ask about this in-group Pope thing and the Rome right. research drama that's been happening recently. I'm, I, I told you about this before. I'm personally like mostly disinterested in this, but uh, yeah. it does seem like almost a journalistic responsibility to hear yes. from the man himself about the issue. Right. So is there anything you'd like to say about the in-group Pope role or uh, Rome research right. drama and so on? Yes, um, yeah. So so as I mentioned earlier, I should probably say something here, but um, uh, well, Here's the here's the context. Um, in group Pope was a bracket on Twitter. Yeah, some um, people have no idea what in group is as well. So let's take yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or even what Rome is. true. Is. So uh, thankfully, James has made this edifying meme that explains yes. the whole thing. But anyway, <laughs> all right. For context, anyone listening about to hear this bit about online drama, this is a complete waste of your time. There is no reason Skip ahead, in, like five, at all. 10, 20 minutes, you know, it'll yeah, be better after that. You, you do not need this in your mind, okay? No one does, but here we are, okay? So we have to deal with, you know, deal with the, play the hand we're dealt. Um, all right, let's knock this out. So what is in-group? And I, I, I'm just going to because I'm the one talking, I'm just gonna pretend that I'm authoritatively able to comment on what all these things are. Um, so to answer what is in group, you have to answer what are post rats, to answer what are post rats, you have to answer what are rationalists. So, so we're just gonna knock oh, these God. out of right. right. We're gonna do this on a timer. I'm, I'm gonna crank through it, okay? Rational, uh, well, to really talk about, no, just kidding. Oh, I was geez, gonna say, <laughs> to really talk about rationalists, you have to go back to Descartes, but like, you know, really to talk about Descartes, you really should be talking about Plato and, um, uh, let's uh, go on. Heraclitus like and <laughs> why not? And, you know. Right, right, right. Rationalists are a group of nerdy people who are also fucking brilliant. They call, I have to stand the rationalists, they called, a, bit, a, a bunch of them called crypto early um, and sort of became wealthy. But like on, on the whole, there's a lot of software engineers and et cetera. Um, there's a guy, you should Google Eliezer Yudkowsky. There was a blog, still is a blog, new version of the blog called Less Wrong. And um, it became a community largely centered in the Bay Area, also in New York, also some in Oxford and around the world. That's who the rationals are. Post rats are um, rationalists who don't like calling themselves that. Um, or people who had some kind of break with the ideas of rationality. Maybe they felt harmed in some way by the ideas of rationality. Maybe they just thought that something else was more wholesome and whatever. Um, and uh, there's sort of a sort of co collective cultural sense that there's this group of people called post rats who have a different sense of what truth is or how to be in the world, um, who like vibing more than they like being, you know, uh, to use the internet slang, being autistic about everything. Um, and um, that's who the post rats are. I'm doing good so far. Okay, in group, I, I I have to I have to fucking um, 
Oh, no, no, I'm not going to get into that part. So in group is a joke or was a joke about how something that the post drafts have been into, which is like social psychology. And in social psychology, there's the idea of the in group and the out group. And you like the in group and you're not a fan of the out group. And you coordinate with the in group and you try to defeat the out group, et cetera. So in group was always a sort of, as far as I understand it or whatever, a tongue in cheek joke about how like, oh, you know, well, I'm an in group, so we're good, right? It's sort of like a nerdy way of vibing over like we're friends, but like we kind of know the surrounding context of like humanity is this horrifying Lovecraftian beast coming out of the ancient evolutionary history of, of blood and murder. Uh, but like, we're cool, you know? <laughs> so that's how I understand the, where that came from or where it really comes from intellectually. Okay, good. In group pub, we're cranking through this. Um, there was a Twitter bracket, um, a bracket meaning uh, people voting with Twitter polls um, for who would be, quote, the in group pope. It was not defined what this means. Um, it was not explained what those responsibilities it would hold. It was simply said, we are going to vote for the in group pope. Here are the 12 options. Over four days, there was a contest. Uh, in which I participated, there was vote buying, there was back end, you know, dealing, uh, there were people saying I'll support you if you reject this person in this round because I think that they're going to beat me in the whatever. Um, did I mention the vote buying already? Like people were literally buying votes, like spending real American dollars or whatever on, on, uh, on bots to vote in the thing. Um, and there was propaganda and I was one of the chief uh, exporters of that propaganda. Um, <laughs> and uh, as a result of a, a sort of variety of factors, a confluence of a variety of factors and the will of God, I was crowned in group five. Okay. So that's what that is. It's, it's a, it's, that's what it is, I, right? So, you know, how, how serious is it? How much does it matter? Some might say that it is mere memory um, just a stupid joke. Um, I will comment to the side. I hope that I have not offended too many Catholics. At least I hope I haven't offended the cool ones. But if I've offended the cool ones, like, I hope that that can be rectified because, like, I don't, I actually, I think Catholicism's cool. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I just, you know, don't want to give anybody the middle finger. And um, I'm just a dude who's confused about religion and trying to figure shit out. But also, I think things are funny. And I like when things are funny. And I like making jokes. And I don't want to back down on that front either right um i am I, I take very deeply deeply and seriously questions of spirituality i take much less deeply um human social structures sort of and human you know human beings preferences i, I should I, I shouldn't talk about humans as human beings you definitely sound like a sociopath if you do that but um I'm let's not move a sociopath. on I, i'm on record i'm not a sociopath yeah not a sociopath don't have a nazi fetish um so uh there's Getting, getting these sort of fundamentals nailed down. All right, that's what in-group hope is. There have been jokes, there have been memes, it isn't fun. All right, the next bit to finally get to the the, the stupidest part of this entire thing. Um, I work at Rome Research, I have for not long, a couple of months, I just got this job, all right? Um, I didn't really wanna talk about this that much online, but it's sort of, it's a cat's out of the bag, so that's the thing that's happening. Um, and in this context, I want to try desperately to disclaim any possible sense that I'm speaking for the company because I am not doing that here. I'm not trying to do that here. Um, take that power away from me. Um, rest it from my hands. It is not my desire. Um, that said, uh, Rome has a subreddit. The subreddit sometimes has spicy takes and haters and people posting like, I used Rome and I'm switching to this other product because, you know, the company is like messed up, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it has like sort of interesting PR profile. And um, in part, uh, it's because Connor White Sullivan, the founder, has an interesting PR profile on Twitter. And um, I think he's brilliant. I think he's fucking awesome. Uh, he can be spicy on Twitter and it is what it is, right? And so whatever. Uh, basically, what happened is I stepped into the subreddit introduce myself where my intended message was, um, if you get banned from the subreddit and want to appeal that, you can ask me. And I, in fact, unbanned some people. What was heard was something like, well, so, so I, I will admit that I did introduce myself as the in-group poke. Now, this may not have been the, the most <laughs> advisable thing to do. I've received a lot of messages, you know, sort of like a ideas from different people that this was a deeply stupid thing to do, um, including a few of the vocal members of the subreddit. 
I then made the error of someone commented and leaving what I still think was a not great comment that broke all of the rules that we had just introduced to the subreddit. I immediately banned them before realizing that, like, you know, they're maybe an important part of the extended from community. I, just, I don't know. I had just woken up. I was like, what the hell? Um, I dropped the ball there and basically then shit exploded. Um, people were tweeting about it. Some guy made a video, you know, talking about how deeply concerning it is that like this guy has introduced himself as in-group hope and the cult language and religiosity has really gotten far. And like, is this the fall of room research? So that's what happened. That, uh -huh. That's my comment on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think this is probably pedantic, but I, I yes. would, I would uh, take issue with the identification between post rats and the rat lineage and in group uh maybe i'm post rat in that i've never wanted to be a post rat or something but i don't consider i wasn't i don't consider myself a rationalist or post rat and the way i would i would frame in in group in group is uh just like a community of people on twitter that are like very online very aware of each other's presence are on twitter a bunch and are like more there to like hang out and be friends rather than like promote yeah. something or like do something. It's like, Hey, these are cool people that are like fun to hang out with, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and, and no, no conversation about post rats would be complete without objections to everyone else's statements on the subject. Um, no, yes. I, I do actually agree with what you said. I probably spoke to it too much in terms of where I came from, but right. oh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of people have assembled in, in this space. For sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, Huh. I think that's basically all that needs to be said about that. I'm I'm just like, as I said, eminently bored by the topic of uh, this Rome drama. So there's all the other things we've been talking about are much more interesting to me. So is, is there anything else you want to say about that before we move along or any addenda or sp speeches to the people? Uh, uh, just briefly, um, you know, um, I hope to perform my obligations successfully. I have learned some things. Um, I apologize for nothing. Um, I am, I act and speak with the conviction that this will all be fucking hilarious um, when I'm talking about it on Jimmy Kimmel in, you know, 2035. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I try to live my life in a way that that is, that is, um, that's funny. And, uh, but, you know, people get offended. I don't always know why. And like, it's my job to, to learn. So like, there, there's, authenticity there and important stuff and again only speaking as myself here and uh I, d I don't have all the pr skills i just don't have it like i tweet under my name i have boldness i have creativity i have adaptability you know um i don't have um all of the things related to whatever pr is about and professional standards of a certain variety like you know to me professionalism is about you know uh it's like it's about responsibility and like conducting yourself in a way that is possible to coordinate with um and it's not about like stodginess or being actually boring um but you know what i mean like to have a lot to learn and i want to learn it so mm -hmm. that's all all i really have to mm -hmm. wrap up with that Mm -hmm. But thanks for asking about it. I you know, feel good having said something. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, it's a service to the people that actually care about this, which yeah. I think is neither, at least not me, but, uh, you know. I care about it because I'm involved in it. So, sure. I, and I think, you know, I appreciated the jokes. Like, basically, if anyone engaged with the spirit of humor, like, you're on my fucking side, whether you want to be or not, because um, I think I find this shit hilarious. So. James made the most epic meme of all time uh, yeah. about it. So well done. We stand James. uber super. We stand yeah. uber super. Follow him on YouTube. Follow him on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Well, let, let's let's circle back then. And um, we talked about the courtesy vibe reel in particular and a little bit about Mammon. And as you know, I'm yeah. also a huge fan of Speed. I think that's actually my favorite as much as courtesy is up my alley. I think Speed is just a masterpiece. Oh, cool. um, but uh, tell me what 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 is a vibe reel and how did you get that idea and uh, tell me yeah. tell me a bit more about them kind of big picture. Um, so I did write I have been writing about this on and off on my Substack. Yes. Um, and 
um, how should I put it? Um, there's something very, uh, vibe reels are a practical idea. I'm not always that great at being practical. I'm very comfortable in philosophical idea spaces and we're comfortable like just contemplating. Um, I'm trying to become more and more comfortable just doing shit. And, um, you know, since I left my last job, I have been trying to find ways to get my thoughts into the world in part because it's a very concrete activity that you can grind on and iterate on high feedback, good learning environment. So I've, I've done tweets, blog posts, um, long tweet storm things, um, short videos, videos of many different types. Um, uh, I did my Twitch show, philosophers on Twitch playing flight simulator, we did 30 episodes of that been on other people's podcasts to some degree. Um, and uh, the vibe reels felt like the next step and the next step of just uh, sort of enshrining value in art in artifacts in some way. Um, and uh, I wanted to, I wanna learn how to make cooler and cooler stuff. And there's this convenient fact, uh, which is that there are um, stock footage websites and there are copyright free music things and there some of these are free and some of these are paid and you can also uh, sometimes like pay a couple dollars to somebody on Bandcamp to get the rights to one of their um, you know uh, six cyberpunk like you know mixes or whatever and uh, also I did start messing around with voiceover so speed you mentioned uh, is you know brings in this quote from the Italian futurists in manifesto, um, these young Italian artists who were trying to talk about like this very intense and like vigorous spirit of, of creation that they wanted to be into. Um, I got this Italian dude on Fiverr and I paid him to do the voiceover and I learned a lot while doing it. So in a sense, in a sort of practical lens, vibe reels are my, they're my drafts. I mean, they're just like a way to keep drafting to keep tacking toward making cooler and cooler stuff so I can make um, extremely cool stuff. You know, Kanye West has these lines about, you know, what is it like five, four beats a day for five beats a day for four summers or something like that. Um, and how he would, you know, every summer make four or five beats a day. And, you know, after four years of four or five beats a day, you've made a whole lot of, I don't know the math there. You know, what is it? Three months, call it ninety. Three and a half months, ninety. Call it like a hundred days, times four beats is you know four hundred times four summers, like sixteen hundred beats. You know sixteen hundred to two thousand. Like when I'm six, you know, the, do the, what is the visas thing? You know, do something a hundred times. Like if you do two thousand times, you can also uh, get summer too. So um, that's the kind of spirit of of, of that from a practical uh, creation perspective. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, huh. I'm curious what, like, one of the questions I definitely wanted to ask you is, like, and, and we've talked a fair bit about this, but would be curious yeah. to hear more, especially with time and, and perspective, like, um, what your experience was of working on the music video that we did together and, like, what that was like for you and, um, yeah, yeah, anything you want to say about that? Yeah, do you have a question about any particular part of it? I, I, I can also just say stuff. Yeah, start with just saying stuff and, yeah. Um, well, one thing I'm in the process of is figuring out the infrastructure behind how I want to keep making things. It's getting to the point where I should probably hire people to make stuff. Um, mm. You know, I work at Rome. I have a salary. Um, I don't need to do anything with it. Like, I, I would honestly like to spend as much of it as I can on whatever will push the cutting edge on me making cool stuff. Um, and so like I uh, have, I did post about this. I did uh, have been paying somebody, um, a Twitter person, a lot of people here know actually, but I shouldn't have said that, it doesn't matter, um, uh, to listen to me rant. And because this is part of how I figure out what's next and what the vision is. Um, but I should probably be, you know, getting someone to like, browse all the stock footage sites and come up with like, here are, you know, 40 ideas of your next, what could be your next vibe reel and they all kind of, I can pick and choose or an editor or, you know, um, I have bought some camera equipment, like camera person, you know, just like, 
even like not at a place where I can pay full salaries for all these people, but this infrastructure stuff is like the next step that I really need to grasp, like what that should look like and make some, um, some bets on that and see what it turns into. And you did me a great service in giving, you know, coming to me with this project of um, you know, making this music video um, in part because, you know, like, I mean, like literally, you know, it's not too gauche to say, but like you were willing to pay for it. And I was like, sick, you know, I mean, it's partially like a confidence thing, like being paid to do something that you actually want to do that you like are now I'm a bit more confident, but it, like at the time you're like, not sure. You're like, is this, is the, is the earth, you know, uh -huh. is the soil receptive to the, to the sea that I want to plant in it? And it's like, um, it's a empowering thing. So that was one part. And then the other, another part was like collaboration. You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't want to just be me at a laptop for the next 30 years making vibe reels. I want to build things with people. And I've tweeted before about one of my, one of the people I, my kind of idols is Hideo Kojima, who is a Japanese video game, video game guy um, who made the Metal Gear Solid series. He made this game Death Stranding. Um, he's a little bit controversial, controversial. And oh, I said it like that because um, he made this game Death Stranding that people criticized as a walking simulator because you just kind of walk for like a lot of the game. Um, but he he's got music from um, churches in there. Um, he's got music from um, what is it? The song's called Low Roar. There's a bunch of them. I, I forget this other this other artistic group. Um, in that game for energy, you drink Monster. Um, your dude like goes to his like weird little futuristic cave thing to like prepare for the next journey you like to have six cans of monster on the desk uh norman Reedus is in the game he's in this zombie show uh, walking dead and um you know at one point you can get like a motorcycle that he uses in this other show he's in and like a lot of this stuff could be uh, mads mickelson is in the game fucking love mads mickelson um and also you, you get these like uh in a lot of games you get um little trinkets that you like find around in like secret locations and all of the trinkets in Death Stranding have these little, a short couple paragraphs of uh, Hideo Kojima talking about his love of stuff. Like he's like, here's this old horror movie about a car that becomes sentient. It's like, you haven't heard about it, right? You get this kind of like back, back behind the scenes view, kind of like Tarantino, where it's like you watch Tarantino movie, you're watching 500 movies because all the references and different things in there. And if you're a nerd about it, you can just crawl into this, this space and like, this uh, curation that this um, cutting edge auteur, I think is the word has, has pre produced for you. And Kojima just like, it just radiates through that he was like having fun. He loves stuff. He loves like the Union Jack. He just loves the flag. He loves the Rolling Stones. You know, he like, you know, loves um, these like, he likes uh, what are those like mech things that people like mm -hmm. Gundams and stuff like, and like, um, so, Anyway, like he's kind of like an example, uh, Kanye also um, of sick collaboration, you know, like a uh, perfect example of Kanye is like flashing lights is like 10 like all star performers on it is like a great song. And so um, anyway, we're working on that was like a, a an instance is like, again, a little put a few co coins in the piggy bank on the thing you care about and sort of like give the, you know, pay your respects at the shrine, you know, make an offering to the gods of like I do indeed value this and even though i'm not there yet in every way that i want to be i'm i'm starting now you know mm -hmm. um yeah yeah that was that was really clear to me from the beginning like that uh just like the three of us you me and danny J, who made the music could do something that was just like far bigger than anything any one of us could do alone and that that was like what made the thing so um yeah like when Dan i mean i've said this before but when danny J made the music he was like oh can you record a video of, of you dancing it uh to it and i was like oh well we're gonna have to have kersey edit it there's uh -huh. you know because because if it was just i mean if you imagine there's an alternate universe where like i made the video and it's me just just literally danny j's music over it like i don't know if yeah my editing skills just putting it on top like mm, that that would be you know but the video is epic so it's not as hot yeah you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah no we, yeah. we did get on that one so uh and, I, and i'm I excited I, about your next your next things I, I don't know how much you talk about you know what the status of all that is but um yeah it's 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 coming soon it's coming i'm ready yeah. i'm ready yeah. yeah um yeah and 
could you tell me a little bit more about, I feel like this is actually pretty critical to understanding where you're coming from and like this auteur concept and also maybe Kanye in particular, like, I don't know. I've yeah. listened to some of Kanye's music. I, I like the collaboration that he did with Daft Punk a long time ago because I've been a huge mm-hmm. punk fan of Daft Punk for a long time. Um, but like, I'm like very much an outsider to Kanye and would be curious to hear more from you about like, yeah, what, what you admire about him and what you think is going on there. Let, less, as you said, sort of from the like, lineage perspective and more just like, mm-hmm. what's your experience listening to him and being a fan and admiring him as like for you? Yeah, let me think for a second about that. Um, uh, Kanye is spiritually interesting to me. And um, also his career is interesting to me. Um, The career thing is a a little bit more straightforward. um, And it does relate to the auteur idea. Um, I mentioned Hideo Kojima, talking about Kanye, and another one is Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a uh, Kojima a little bit less so he sort of found his niche in video games and just been cranking up video games um and but I also don't know as much about what other projects he's involved in um but Kanye and Walt Disney both have a feature that they make something sick they cross that infrastructure boundary to like change it to qualitatively change how it is that they make sick shit and then they make the next sick thing um you know disney likes drawing he's a kid who likes drawing cartoons i've known many such kids in my life you know and um then he sold these shorts to um distributors in theaters who put them before movies and then they came up with the idea of the silly symphonies you know and silly symphonies were novel because they had animation they threw music behind it and um they would literally make sheet music and record like people at their studio, like honking like geese and, you know, laughing like a, you know, like a raven or you know, whatever, fucking like a pig and do whatever. They just, these cra- crazy sounds behind these silly symphonies. Um, they came up with the, with Mickey Mouse, right? And Mickey Mouse blew up. People wanted more Mickey Mouse stuff. They made the Mickey Mouse Club, which was just like a, actually at the time, like an afternoon school program where they said things like, don't swear and don't chew tobacco and, you know, but like do your homework or whatever. I don't even know if they had homework back then, probably just had good lives instead um, or not. I don't fucking, maybe they got beaten by their parents. I don't know anything. <laughs> about the, um, you know, it's the patty, you know, it's Lindy, it's, it's trad, it's good. Um, and uh, and uh, then, um, yeah, Mickey merchandise popped off. Disney thought he wanted to make a feature film. They made Snow White in the fifties. I think like Clark Gable and his it was the 30s, girlfriend. Actually. Was the 30s? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, of course, because it's before the war. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, they there's all this criticism, like, oh, but no, you know, what adult is gonna want to watch um, yeah. a cartoon? And you know, then they all these celebrities come and they're they're crying, you know, like when when uh, Snow White eats the apple and like the 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 dwarves are sobbing and they're saying it's just like people are crying, <laughs> it's like you know, this breakthrough event. Um they build all this infrastructure to make feature films. The war happens, he makes propaganda for the government and training films for like Navy stuff, you know, about um, how to, you know, make sure you don't break the ship or whatever they need to train people in. And then after the war, and he sort of loses the spirit for making feature films. The company still makes them, but he's sort of not as interested. And he starts playing with trains, starts playing with model trains, builds a model train set in his backyard and rides it around in circles and hangs out with his kids. and there's a little bit of like, has he lost his touch? I mean, what the, what the hell is, is he going to just ride trains? And then um, then he comes up with Disneyland, right? And the connection is obvious in retrospect. You're like, he's thinking about turning this Disney ethos into reality, right? He's sort of drawing it out of fiction, right? Into a, a, some kind of strange real world thing. And then famously, um, you know, by the end of his life, he's working hard on Epcot, the experimental prototype city of tomorrow. Um, which was going to be this futuristic city and they were going to have electric rail lines uh, bringing people to work and they it was completely like centrally planned you know cybernetically planned which weird some weird modern people out we don't like seeing a perfectly structured you know circles around concentric circles of like living hives or whatever but like you know he was going to make the city he had he bought land in i think florida and uh, was all set up to like 
build it, you know, it's sort of like some kind of weird Disney kingdom, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and then he died and the project got turned into like a resort, which it is now and sort of like a resort and there's like a history center, but it's nothing like what it was going to be. And so anyway, the, I, um, Kanye, um, moves from music and he's trying to move into fashion and has moved into fashion and he had these deals with nike and adidas and different stuff like that and if you look at uh scroll back on kanye's twitter um and watch some of his interviews um he's designing like buckminster fuller type like structures for people to live in you know these like weird partially under like like sort of it's kind of like an indoor beach kind of thing with like a hole in the ceiling where like natural light can come through and um you know he's talking about like growing certain type of fabric on his land in wyoming to make this you know and so like he's trying to he's sort of like going into this odd kind of futurism space um while also he's becoming more religious and like that really religiosity is becoming more important to him and who knows where that's gonna go um but uh he talked on joe rogan about like a million person chorus becoming a million people sing the same you know sing the praise of god at the same time and it's like the, the earth would shake or something i don't even know what would happen but that's just like now what i'm trying to say with, with these stories is that um it's like a template to me it's like a career template and um the the auteur part is that there's this kernel of artist artistry um artistic creativity but it's not just that it's also um business decision making and infrastructure building and like organization design and uh, uh steve jobs is another example you know it's uh, the, the iphone and all the apple stuff and pixar and it's like has this trajectory so um you know things change i could be wrong about all kinds of things but i'm currently plotting things out that way and so that's that's a, a major reason that I'm interested in Kanye and these and these other sort of types of people. Hmm. Uh, how would you sort of summarize that career template as or, as it were, or like what's common between say Walt Disney and Kanye? Because I, I get a sense of it, but I'd be curious to hear how you describe it. Yeah, it, it's it's that there's a like uncompromising artistic integrity that leads the endeavor but it's not the career of an artist only. Um, and they learn, they find a way to expand the process. Like there really is this effort to build an institution and build a huge project in a way that, and, and the, the art it keeps overcoming itself. And then you see how art is spiritual vision. Um, because, you know, and that's the, 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 there's a blog post I wrote called Michelangelo's Shelter. Uh, this one is on my personal website. It's michaelkersey.com and it's, it's over there. And um, I wrote that, you know, before I'd made any vibe reels, before I'd done any Twitch shows, before I'd really made that many blog posts, before I felt like I was good at Twitter and you know, I'm just getting started. Okay. Right. So it's like in 20 years, I will be able to say it's before I ever made them or whatever I make then. And it's like, uh, I talk about how Michelangelo built the David, carved the David in this wooden shack, um, sitting in the middle of Florence, I think. And the, the piece of marble was allegedly, the story goes a crappy piece of marble like fell on its side on its on this like hundreds of miles thousand mile journey and cracked somewhere the david kind of stands at this angle in part because like there was a crack you know in the thing and um he puts in the shelter and it's like when you're sitting there with your shitty piece of marble right um do you see a shitty piece of marble or do you see the david right and there's this aspect of you know he built it in the shelter Oh yeah. But also, by the way, that the, the stone just sat there in Florence, like getting rained on for like 20 years. Um, and then this kid shows up who it happens had just carved the Pieta. So he was, you know, definitely like a, you know, wonderkind. It's like 23 or 
27, he's 26 or something when he's like working on the David. Um, they, they, they don't make them like that anymore. Um, or maybe they do, but, but he, he certainly was, it was a special one. And, um, but he surrounds it with this, with this shelter. And it's like, I guess part of what I was experiencing when I wrote that is like the eyes of the multitude, like burn because if you have the kind of extroverted narcissistic or artistic instinct, like I do, you want to be seen, you want your shit to be seen. But also if you care enough about what you're doing, you fucking hate what you're making because it's not awesome yet. In part, because art, as I can't, I can't like speak for artists, but I think a lot of people will resonate that like in any field you get into it because of the coolest shit that exists. And then you have to retreat from the fucking heights of divinity and be like, all right, yeah, I, uh, have to you know like be upset that this guy is overcharging me for the fucking voice note because i didn't do the right type of rights and he doesn't know that i have a destiny god damn it and you're like <laughs> it's like you, you you know you know uh we we labor in ugliness and that, that's that's a, a phrase that i use and it's like shit doesn't start feeling beautiful after until a long way in um but uh part of the joy I think of being a kid usually is is make stuff. You're not worried about whether it's good, but um, I, I think that uh, there's a thesis antithesis synthesis to sort of like youth and maturity on some of these topics. And um, people say like dance, like nobody's watching. I don't believe in that. I, I, I'm not good at dancing. I don't dance. So I, I'm, I'm actually, I shouldn't use this example, but like what, what I mean by that, it's like, you want to know what's true. And so you can pretend like no one can see you and that can get you somewhere. And probably some people should do that, but people can see, right? The, the truth of it is like, people can see your flaws. People like, I don't know, this is a little bit of my, my intensity, uh, but it's like, when I make stuff, it pains me. It's even my good things pain me because I see the flaws and I can imagine somebody thinking, damn, he should have clipped that like a couple frames later. And I'm like, fuck, I know, <laughs> you know, and it's like, um, Kanye does this too. in some of his interviews, like often he talks about how like he made the greatest whatever of some time, but then sometimes caveat stuff will be like, you know, like he has repudiated gold digger a little bit. He's like, well, you know, you make some just cause that's sort of how you make an album that works. It's like, you can tell it's not his favorite. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, this whole anguished artistry thing, I think I, I think, I think I've learned to work, work it, you know, and I, and I think it's a system that you can learn, um, how to, how to do, but, um, I barely feel comfortable calling myself an artist, but I decided to just keep doing it to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I really resonate with a lot of that. Um, I mean, as you say, things change and it's hard to know the future, but do you have a sense of what you'd like to do as you sort of scale up your infrastructure and focus on things? Like, do you have a sense of what's coming down the pipeline or are you going to revive the Twitch show? What's going to happen? Yeah. Um, as far as Twitch goes, I really do enjoy, I really did enjoy doing a lot of Twitch streaming and I have to think about it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to do it the right way. Um, it's possible that I should just have sort of like a semi-open slot where like most weeks I host someone and just hang out and talk about stuff. Um, but I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I like the like, you know, I like that I can say that I like the philosophers on Twitch playing Flight Simulator property, you know, like I like, mm -hmm. it's not, like, I like the, I like the memes. I like the, the jokes. I like Flight Sim. I like, I like hosting my friends and just seeing what wacky shit happens because it's live and I just I love a lot of it and um uh and I am feeling that and I just want to figure out the right way to, to do it um and as far as what's coming next in the bigger picture I don't know um you know one always thinks of like movies um but also I think movies are the most visible um coolest artifacts around um, and I want to spend some time thinking about like, what should new media be? You know, what could be different? Um, movies are, um, not inter interactable. They're one, they're unidirectional. Video games are, are bi-directional, right? You can affect it and it affects you back. Um, both feel like consumption to me and 
I don't think that has to be a bad time. There's a time to consume, you know? And, um, but uh, I wonder what could be more active, you know what I mean? Like just in terms of like, I don't know, I'd, if I don't have to put somebody in a chair for two hours and I can have them do be doing something, that's sort of cool. But I, I want to spend a bunch of time thinking about this kind of theory of, there's like sort of like a technological angle. It's like sort of like, what's the next big thing? Um, you know, the next Pixar isn't going to be Pixar, where I'm, I'm referencing Pixar here as an innovation, you know, an innovator in the technology of filmmaking, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's just a way of saying, I don't know yet. Yeah, fair, fair. Yeah. Hmm. But, but I'm going to keep making, I don't know, like follow me on Twitter. Like I'm just going to keep making cool stuff, right? And I'm going to share it with the world. So the, the pro, I believe in the process. Mm -hmm. say. Definitely, definitely. Is there anything um, adjacent to the things that we've talked about that you want to dive into more or talk more about? Um, I, I could talk about anything, but uh, nothing's immediately coming to mind. If you have a different, uh, if there's some kind of prompt, I can go with that. But uh, one, one that had sort of uh, on my mind is, um, you know, in this, in the series of propaganda pieces you put out for the Pope election, uh, you had a piece mm. that uh, cited uh, John O'Donohue, uh, and I, I don't actually know who that is, so I'm sure you can say something about that, but I'll just read it now and then ask you about it. But you said, he said, uh, many people are deeply disappointed in the version of God they've been offered, a domesticated, disapproving God. And I think one of the tasks of our time for those that are interested in God is to make God dangerous again. Um, yeah, yeah. What, what appeals to you about that quote and why did you use it and what, what's going on there? Yeah, I was actually trying to find the full quote because I did clip something out of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, make God dangerous again. Um, the full quote actually is better. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether I can find this in such short notice. Um, try one more time, but I, let's see if my Google Foo will serve me in this uh, time of time of need. This looks right. Yeah. yeah so I'll, I'll just throw in some of the context. So he says, "I think that there is a wonderful danger in God that we have totally forgotten." Because one of the things humanoids like to do is they like to bring in the tamers to tame their deities down. They don't like the idea of a wild god because it could get very awkward and deeply embarrassing. And one of the reasons that young people are leaving religion is because God has died for them or become incredibly boring and uninteresting. And I think one of the tasks of our time for those that are interested in God is to make God dangerous again. Um, yeah, um, I don't really, I don't really know who John O'Donohue is. I. Um, someone mentioned the, the someone saw an early draft of the Pope thing and they're like oh yeah this reminded me and I was like that totally it's someone I've had a bunch of conversations with who kind of gets my sort of spiritual outlook and I was like yeah th that works um, I tried a few other quotes and that, that was the one I liked um, religion is such a such a weird topic it's such a hard topic because um, there's so many it's like a land, landmine type of topic there's so many different rabbit holes to go down and important but t thing important distractions i would say like there's a lot of important distractions where um questions of doctrine and you know things like well what religion is true it's like very important type of question i pro in some way in some important even if you dissolve the question um it was important question to dissolve or whatever um but like it's so hard to comment on, on religion because people often feel like that needs to come first like they, they're like, okay, but are you telling me this or this? Are you giving me what? An, which answer are you giving? They want to know where the where the 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 feed is coming from, right? They want to know who's who's uh, you know what you're selling, right? Who's who's shit you're selling? Um, in part because, especially you know in a, in 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 America, we we were fucking salesmen, like everyone's selling something, right? And um, uh, but religion's been selling stuff since since people figured out, you know. Mesopotamia since before then probably and um thinking about the Sumerians basically the the educated Sumerian priest class knew when the tide would come in you know they knew when the river would change and when that when it would flood actually it was floods um and when that would fuck up your crops and other people didn't know 
and they would use that knowledge to that, that's how they would sort of gate their power like that was part of the justification of their power and then you know they would uh you know they might let your crops get flooded or not let people know um because uh if you weren't like paying your taxes or whatever sort of my, my understanding of it this is derivative i haven't decided enough it's referenced in carol quigley the evolution of civilizations incredible book um but point is um as far as commenting on religion um there are still things i i like trying to say that I want to try to say. And uh, that quote in part to me is like, and again, if you're talking to believers and non-believers, you want to say things different ways. And so that's also part of what makes it challenging. Um, but uh, for me, the, the language of God has been personally useful. I'll say that, um, that way of talking about like life and outlook and where we're all going and what matters. And um, in part, I've only been able to find it useful when I was able to contextualize it in my life in the right way. And, you know, if your idea of religion is like, and as it is for some people, like a bunch of stupid old superstitions, we're not talking about, we're not having the same conversation because I also think that there's a bunch of stupid old superstitions and um, I hope I don't offend anybody, but I have heard that there are like facts in the Quran about like whales and what they are and how they work that are just not true. And you can go down the rabbit hole of like, maybe there were different whales then, but like also like, I think I'm okay with that. You know, <laughs> like I'm, I think I'm okay with the, the, the spiritual, um, uh, the, the prophet being wrong about whales, like, you know, and, and th that makes me not orthodox in a certain way that, th and that is a decision. Right. Um, but also like people underestimate religion, the religions, um, people underestimate every ideology that they haven't learned a lot about because brilliant people come up with shit. And a lot of ideologies, even totally failed ones have deep and ancient roots and like powerful, important concepts behind them. Like I would say every, almost every, or maybe every idea, I don't know what, whether I would um, uh, categorize some ideology as outside that group, um, including the evil ones, you know, and that's a spicy thing to say, but like, I think you could think can be evil and like based on cool ideas. It's like, um, you know, Lucifer is a fallen angel. He has one sin, it's pride. <laughs> that's what makes you the devil. Right. And, and, uh, but, but, um, when it comes to religion, you know, a thing I like to note, and again, it's because I branched off from like, you know, Richard Dawkins style atheism, which I was into in like high school or whatever, I branched off from that. So this is what is feels relevant to me. Um, I believe it's, and if I'm not misremembering, I believe, uh, at Westminster Abbey, um, the, major church in London, Copernicus and Darwin are both buried, okay? And uh, no, not Copernic Isaac Newton, sorry, Isaac Newton and, and, uh, and Darwin are both married, uh, both buried. And, you know, Isaac Newton is, is sitting there in marble uh, with his book and his, um, his engineer's angle, you know, the, those things they have. And there's a globe and there's like little cupids around him and he's out there doing science. And, um, you know, the, 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 there's a version of like science versus religion that like anyone, in my opinion, who knows about enough about science or religion um, knows it doesn't work like that. And I, I don't, I, I know there are some like cool, important, like hardcore atheist, modern scientist type people, but like back in the day, the, 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 it wasn't understood. Like these are like different things. It's like truth is truth. And, and um, you know, so as far as making God dangerous again, I mean, making it relevant again, like um, I go in and out of the sense that I can just like ask out a question, but like sometimes I do feel like I can, I can at least ask. I may not know how to interpret what happens after I ask, uh, but I can ask and um, that feels relevant and also dangerous. It's like also irreverent. Um, you know, there's like the, the Kanye mentions the Ricky Bobby type prayers. This is the, the, Will, Fer Will Ferrell movie, uh, where it's got Ricky Bobby's like praying to little baby Jesus and, you know, and, and you know, I mentioned Will, Will Ferrell praying and like, you get into these spaces, you're like, 
do I pray about like, you know, small things like trivial things? It's like, maybe, you know, do I pray that like the Valheim update comes out soon where it's like, you know, you, you have a reaction to, the, to that idea, idea and it's something you can listen to. So I don't know, maybe it's make, you know, the, the danger might be the feeling of relevance, hmm. spiritual relevance. Yeah, I was thinking about it. I think when I first saw that quote, the thing that like really uh, made it intriguing for me was the adjective dangerous, but stewing on it, like, you know, you first made that video, I don't know, like a month ago or five weeks ago or something. And then thinking about it since then, like, I think the actually really interesting part of that quote is, is, is quieter, subtler, but is the verb make, like make mm. God, you know, cause you could, you could just as easily put in like sexy or I like relevant. I think that's good, but like make mm -hmm. God, like what, it, what, what kind of theology is under like making their, uh, I know, I, I could gloss it a certain way, but I don't know if that's how he meant it. And I don't know how you meant it. And, uh, uh, well, there's another quote yeah. at the very end of that vibe reel where uh, that's actually, it's actually Leonard Cohen mm. um, in this very awesome uh, kind of sort of, sort of like the Jewish version of a fire and brimstone sp speech, you know, mm. fire and brimstone, like it's like pre, it's not, a, you don't call it a speech. It's like a, kind of like a sermon type of idea. Um, and in that uh, someone asks him, asks Leonard Cohen, are you saying, that the Jews have a uh, responsibility to save the world. And he says, the Jews have a responsibility to save God in the world. Mm. And it has a similar, I guess, similar reaction, like, you know, make God this, make God that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think whenever you're, you're talking about God, there's also the nearby idea of people's idea, ideas about God, mm -hmm. right? And Maybe the thing, if you're doing any kind of social religious activity, like preaching or proselytizing or trying to save people or, you know, condemn people or whatever, you know, whatever you're up to, um, you're interacting with people's ideas about the thing. Um, yeah. That's what makes it social is that is the sort of collective shared notion that uh, we're, we're pinging off of. And um, if you're a believer, you hope that your ideas about God don't, re don't remain stuck in as ideas about a thing um to show another one of my videos uh i have one called um uh what is it called something your god concept improving your god concept hmm. um it's literally about this it's like and this is one, one of the dimensions on which I, I think atheists could vibe with me you know which is um when you're contemplating in any way you are interacting with your concepts your your these things in your mind, like, you know, you see a dog and you apply the concept dog, that's a dog, okay? Um, and uh, if you see God, uh, or you may or may not apply the concept God, right? And this is part of the thing that comes up in the religious traditions is that we misunderstand the message, we misunderstand the science, right? And you have to sit and listen and find out. And, um, but, you know, I will be the first person to say that if someone is praying um, to God, it really matters what they mean by God. And the religious people say that too, because there are these pernicious errors like idolatry. There are these pernicious errors like trying to shrink the infinite to something that you can grasp. And it's good to grasp. It's good to want to grasp, but it's also good to understand the scope of the problem um, of, of grasping something huge and um, you know something that keeps unfolding itself to you. And even if you never thought about God once, try to grasp the idea of the universe, right? Like try to grasp the idea of a million. That's so much, so much smaller than the universe. A million, that's the tiniest thing ever. You can barely fucking you know, hold that one, right? You can barely fucking lug that one around with two arms and a and fucking drag it with a truck. You can't do it. Um, or maybe you can, you can try, right? And a person who put, many, many hours into contemplating a million would have a much better sense of it than someone who hasn't. And so um, I forgot how I started rambling about this, but uh, oh yeah, right. So I mean, improving your God's concept, I'm talking about improving the, 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 the mental stuff that you're using to orient towards something that is outside the mental stuff, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a that's a, that's a frame for how I do think about like prayer and religiosity and such. Definitely. Yeah. That, that jives with what I was thinking about that quote of like, well, there, there's God and then there's our relationship and social conventions and ideas about God. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, it also reminds me, I mean, I think part of the reason it's interesting to me is, um, you know, and we've talked about this to some extent, but like with loving kindness, I, I've, I've over time kind of come to think like I'm doing two things there with that. One is um, teaching it, right? And I think, I think it's actually taught pretty poorly and that I can do a better job, but that's sort of like a, it's sort of like to use a software analogy, it's like a point update. It's like, not mm. like I'm intrinsically making it better or something, or it's like a version 2.0. I think I'm just like doing it, the, the details better in some ways. Um, mm. uh, almost just, just pedagogically, not like spiritually. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm very clear about the limitations of my own spiritual practice, but in terms of someone that wants to pick up the technique, I think I can help them with that in a way that might be more accessible than even someone who's deeper at the technique or something. Um, mm. But then there's also, uh, and this is even more important and where there's a lot more room for innovation, I think is like inspiring people to do it. Like, I think the, the cutting edge, at, you know, before our video really was mm. like Sharon Salzberg's like book about loving kindness, which I read, I don't know, eight years ago. And it was great. Like, it's a good book, but it's like uh, not something that's gonna reach people today in the same way that like a three minute music video could. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna like do the point updates on the teaching and then like really ideally like revolutionize what it means to inspire someone to do a meditation technique and like a music video, I think is a perfect avenue yeah. for that. Um, I have some other and, ideas too that are even even bolder, but you know, like you say, it takes time to build infrastructure and, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the thing it makes me think about is like, you know, um, there's this part of why I like talk about prayer. Um, I'm like 200 and some 30 something days into my 30 minute a day prayer streak. Nice. Uh, pretty proud of that. Um, and, um, you know, on the margins, I've had to do an extra 10 minutes the next day because I missed 10 minutes or you know, it's been pretty good you know it's not like a you know pretty good but like it has been consistent like the time you know definitely on average it's there um, without any major variations um, anyway nothing anyone cares but part of the reason I I, I care um, part of the reason I talk about it is like I hope to be successful and there's I may not be and I may be and if you're unsuccessful you hope to be successful anyway which is to be discovered after your death, um, you know, like someone like Nietzsche uh, or, or uh, the guy who cut his ear off. I'm pretty sure he was discovered like Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Um, there's also the Picassos of the world who are discovered during their life, and you know, then they go womanize and get rich and do uh -huh. cool, cool stuff. Um, the uh, or whatever. Um, and um, but I want to have been like, in a way, like marching to the same tune the entire time, which is like. Um, I'm trying to think about whether I should, I could say this. So many, many years ago, um, I, uh, let's say a close friend of mine, um, you know, okay, fuck it. I mean, it was one of my exes a million years ago. I will not give it, there's no identifying details. Um, it had been like watching me get into all this like intellectual stuff that uh, those different ideologies. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. It seems fine, whatever. And at a certain point, I met a very famous kind of badass person and I told her about it and she suddenly was like, oh, that's amazing. You know, oh, yeah, I feel like you're like really getting somewhere. And I was just like, you know what? Like, fuck that. Like, I, I didn't I didn't really make a fight out of it, but I was like, you know what? Like, this is the challenge of legibility, which is like, I want to be able to say the truth, which is like the shit that matters was there at the beginning. And I hope that if I am successful, my success speaks to the fundamentals on which it actually rested. Um, and, you know, uh, fucking Mozart wrote Soli Deo Gloria on his, on his sheet music, um, you know, all for the, for the glory of God. And, um, you know, whatever about that language, it's like the, the God stuff doesn't vibe with anybody, but it's also just like, you know, um, having a practice, right? That's like a practical thing. Like, you know, it's load bearing for me. And it's load bearing for you in your life, right? Uh, I am definitely getting to the point where I, I very much do not know who I would be without the practice. Yeah. And um, I, you know, there are people who want who, who want to be able to bear the sorts of load that 
that I can in that area. There are obviously people who can carry much more than I can can in different ways, et cetera. And people, it's also obviously like people can do do whatever they want. Like people get into different stuff for different get different types of value. But if there's someone who can get value from spiritual practice, I want myself to be a I want to be a good advocate for it by being successful and happy and awesome and good, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and also to connect the dots to the things I think are really responsible for it, and for me at least part, and I, and I think also for you, it's, it's the the practice, you know. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Some kind of practice. We have different practices, right? And it's because part of, for me, it's the customizing is part of the practice. You mm-hmm. design your thing, right? Um, so I completely agree. Completely yeah. agree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, this has been terrific, Kersey. It's been great to get a lot more of like the 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 big picture view of what you're up to and where it comes from. And um, I'm hoping that we'll have another conversation like this in the future. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. I, I had a lot of fun. I hope I didn't talk too much. I, no, it's do, great. Do, do, it's we, we get on the format. All right. Oh, perfect. We're perfect. perfect. Yeah. Uh, uh, bye vibe reels. All right. That's all I have to say. <laughs> bye vibe reels. <laughs> bye vibe reels. <laughs> I would if I could, man. <laughs> all, right. all right. I guess great. I should start selling them. All right. <laughs> See you later.